Okay, um, so we finished up Fields Alders on Thursday, so that was the end of that chapter. Um, so the reason that we did 1214 edition was to lead us up into benzene into benzene ring reactions. So I just gave you some problems. We'll go through those and we'll start, we'll do those in a minute. But here is what we want to talk about next are the is a benzene ring. Um, so a benzene ring with the three double bonds and three single bonds alternating is like the ultimate conjugated system because we can write two resonance structures for this which are exactly the same in terms of their energy so you can write the two benzene rings with the alternating double bonds and then what the real resonance hybrid should look like for that is a partial double bond all the way around the ring because every every carbon carbon bond in the ring is between a single and a double bond so it's a perfect one and a half bonds and then when you write the resonance hybrid like this then what we will end up doing is when we write the resonance hybrid like when we write the resonance hybrid like this, then you'll you'll often see that abbreviated as a circle inside of the benzene ring. I try not to do that unless we're just treating the ring as we're not doing anything to the ring, because you need to remember that basically each carbon in the benzene ring has three bonds and then a bond to a hydrogen. So that means if I add any kind of group to that benzene ring, there is no, there are zero hydrogens on that carbon. And sometimes with the circle, people forget about that. Okay, so this is kind of, this is the ultimate conjugated system. And we know that because if I try and take benzene, and I try and do reactions with it that we've done with normal alkane or alkenes, including conjugated dienes, that they won't occur. So if you take this benzene ring and you add bromine to it, you get no reaction. You try and cleave the double bonds with KMnO4 or something like ozone, you get no reaction. You try and add HCl to this, you get no reaction. So the benzene ring is stable enough that it won't undergo reactions that normal alkenes and dienes will undergo. And so will we be able to add things inside the ring or add things to the ring? Yes. And we'll talk about that here at the end. And then tomorrow we'll, that's not, we'll talk about all of that, all the different issues that go into that. Okay. So benzene is basically unreactive right at the moment. Now what we want to talk about is we want to talk about actually um, what happens when you put a side chain on this reaction. Or when you put a side chain on the benzene, what kind of reactions can you do? And there's a couple we'll talk about, and then there are some that we'll go over as we go through all that all those flow, that sort of flowchart reaction scheme that I gave you. First of all, um, in terms of the in terms of positions, when you have two groups on the ring. There is a 1, 2 disubstituted, a 1, 3 disubstituted, 
and one for disubstituted positions. It's no different than cyclohexane. But these have these have more common names that we use. So when you have two groups that are basically one, two disubstituted, that's what's called O standing for ortho. So we t when we have a group on the ring, we're going to talk about the ortho position, which is basically the one, two disubstituted position. When you have one, three, it is what's called meta. So that's the one, three disubstitution. And then one, four is the para position. So we have to remember that, and we'll, and we'll get to a point where we do a lot of reactions, so it won't, be, it won't be remembering, it'll just be, that's, I've done this so many times that I remember that. We have the ortho, the meta, and the para positions, and also then we could use that in the naming, um, which we're not going to spend, well, any time on other than this, but if I... If I went to the dollar store and I bought some mothball stuff, which is supposed to keep the moths from eating your clothes, although I don't know when I open it, when I open a closet up, I'm not greeted by a whole flock of moths coming out. Although I could, you never know. Um, you actually are buying what's called para dichlorobenzene. just as an example of how this works. So you got two, you got a dichlorobenzene. How are they substituted? They're substituted para, which means they're one four. Now we're going to talk about putting groups on the ring and then adding groups to either the ortho and para positions or the meta position tomorrow. And so that's why we have to know ortho, meta, and para is because we're going to do what's we're going to do electrophilic aromatic substitution. And I think that's the basics of benzene. So benzene doesn't react itself until we really start putting some harsh conditions to it, which we will in a second. Um, but the normal reagents will not react with a benzene ring. Once I put a side chain on this, then I'm going to have a lot of the same reactions that we talked about so far, but there's also going to be a special position that we have to take into consideration. Okay. So that's the basics of the benzene, and you're going to go through and read through that in the text. Um, and I'll show you at the end here, I reorganized, I organized everything in the folder so that it should be easier as you're going through the textbook if you want to see, you know, the lecture on that topic. It should be easier, much easier to find now. Um, so that's where we're at. Okay. Let's talk about, let's just talk about one really harsh reaction of benzene. And that is what's called birch reduction. So in birch reduction, you actually destroy the aromaticity of the ring. If the ring is super, super stable, then destroying its, destroying its aromaticity is going to require a really, really harsh reagent. And if this is reduction, it means gaining electrons. So the way we're going to do birch reduction is we're going to basically take sodium metal, we're going to dissolve it in liquid ammonia. So I would normally at this point ask, hey, where have we seen that reaction before? And then there would be an initial point in time when you would just look at me, and somebody might start flipping back through their notes. And you're going to have to flip back all the way back to alkynes for this. 
because this is the reagents that we use when we took an alkyne and we used sodium metal and ammonia, liquid ammonia to form what kind of alkene? Cis or trans? Trans? We agree? And it did form a trans alkene. So that's how we form the trans alkene from the sodium liquid ammonia. Okay. Now, here's what happens when we do that reaction with a benzene ring. No. It is. Because it's sodium metal, so the sodium on the periodic table has one unpaired electron. Because here's what's going to happen. When you put when you put a piece of sodium metal into liquid ammonia, the sodium gives up its electron, and that electron basically is what's called a solvated electron. It's free, and it just kind of runs around the solution. So if you want to do a, the purest reduction that you can, you give something an, uh, you give something an electron. No transfer from one atom to another, just a pure solvated electron, and that's what this does. And so that one electron then is going to add to the carbon-carbon double bond. So let's think about this double bond then. If I add the electron, I'm going to use a half arrow here, or fish hook. If I add that electron, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pair that electron up with one on one carbon and then the other electron gets sent to the other carbon so that when I add my one electron it's going to look like this. You're going to have a pair of electrons here which means you have a negative charge and then I'm going to have an unpaired electron here and so initially when that unpaired electron adds to the benzene ring it basically forms this radical anion. It's half radical, half anion. Now, is this system happy? No. Why not? What's going to make this system really unhappy is the fact that I basically have a negative charge and an unpaired electron which has its own charge. Right? I have electron pairs that are one, two to each other. And that's not going to be very stable. So what the system's going to do is I'm going to draw a resonance structure for this by splitting up this double bond and pairing up the unpaired electron with one of the electrons in that double bond and move the electron there to the para position or to the 1, 4 position. So if I move the electrons around that way, I'm going to end up with my pair of electrons at the top as a negative charge. I'm going to end up with a double bond here, a double bond here, and then an unpaired electron there. And so now what I've done is I've moved the electrons as far away from each other as possible. That's as stable as I'm going to get. So now what happens? Now what happens is there's a hydrogen. A hydrogen could be removed from the NH2 solvent. So the negative charge is going to deprotonate the NH. Remember, C- is stronger than N-. So it's going to remove that pair of electrons so that now I'm going to put a hydrogen here to go with the other hydrogen and then down here I have a radical. A second unpaired or an, a second solvated electron is now going to come in and add to the radical and so I'm going to turn that 
radical into now an anion. And then that anion is going to go ahead and deprotonate the ammonia. So that what I'm going to end up doing is I ended up reducing my benzene ring by adding two hydrogens to it, but specifically those hydrogens are going to end up in the 1, 4 positions. And they end up in the 1, 4 positions simply because this initial, this initial radical anion is forced to have those two unpaired electrons an unpaired electron and then the pair of electrons, they have to be 1, 4 in order to get as far away from each other as possible. And if you go back and you look at the mechanism for the alkyne producing the, the trans alkene, it was exactly the same thing. You had an unpaired electron and a radical anion and they had to be trans in order to get as far away from each other as possible. So that's how the Birch reduction, that's how any reduction with sodium and liquid ammonia works. But that's as powerful of a reduction as we can get. I mean, you can't, you can't do, have a stronger reducing reagent than a basically a single naked electron, even though it's solvated. And that's why and I don't know who the first person is to drop a piece of sodium metal into liquid ammonia. Um, I'm sure the first person that made liquid ammonia probably had, the, had some glassware explode along the way because you've got to keep it cold or else it becomes a gas and pressurizes. But whoever did that, it turns bright blue. And then to, find, to figure out you can do reductions with it is pretty... It's pretty good. So that's birch reduction. So birch reduction always makes the 1, 4, always reduces the 1, 4 positions. And I just made an unconjugated system. Last thing with birch reduction is this. Let's say I'm going to do birch reduction on a sub alkyl substituted benzene ring. I have two possible products I can form here. I could either have I could either add the two H's to have the R group there. Or you could end up with the R group on one of the two, on either the one or the four position. So actually that shouldn't be an arrow, that should just be a plus. So those are my two possible products. Which one of those two do you think is going to form as the major product? Left or right? Somebody take a guess. Left? Was it a guess or is there a reason behind it? Okay.
I mean, you're right. It is the one on the left is going to be the major product, but there's a different reason for that. There is a different reason for it. What's another reason for this product being the major product? The double bond is more is more stable and substituted when the R group is attached to it. So actually that's the reason why is because this is this is kind of a thermodynamic process where we get the the most stable product. So this is one reaction we can do with benzene that destroys the aromaticity. And why would you want to do that? Because you want to destroy the aromaticity to then expose those two double bonds and maybe make them react normally. But this is a harsh, harsh reduction. And it has to be because the benzene ring is so stable. Okay, so that's one reaction of benzene. And that's the only one that we're going to do where you're really destroying the aromaticity. Hydrogenating a benzene is going to be really tough. It can be done, but it's really tough. So that's birch reduction. Now let's put a side chain on this benzene ring and let's see what we can do with it. Now, first thing I can do is I can destroy the I can destroy the side chain. So what I can do is I can oxidize this alkyl benzene. And how am I going to oxidize it? I'm, I can use any of the strong oxidizers that we've talked about. Chromium, H2SO4. Um, we're going to use in lab, we're going to use KMNO4. But any of the strong oxidizers will destroy this side chain. It'll oxidize it. And what it's going to oxidize it to is it's going to oxidize it to a carboxylic acid. And this carboxylic acid is called benzoic acid. So anytime any alkyl benzene is oxidized, you're always going to end up with benzoic acid. So it doesn't matter whether it's one carbon or ten carbons, it doesn't matter whether you have one ring or one side chain, or maybe you have two side chains. If you again use a strong oxidizer on this, you're going to convert that chain into a carboxylic acid. So two chains, you would end up with two carboxylic acids. So that's, I mean, it's a side chain reaction, but it's a side chain reaction to destroy the alkyl group. And it doesn't matter what the alkyl group is, that's the oxidation. And that's going to be an important reaction to remember because that will allow us actually to make a benzoic acid, to add a carboxylic acid to the ring. Okay, final, and then, and then a final kind of reaction and then we're going to work through these. We're going to work through these problems as the example of the other side chains.
the carbon next to the benzene ring is called a benzylic carbon. The benzylic carbon is analogous to the allylic carbon that we talked about last week. The allylic carbon was next to the double bond. The benzylic carbon is next to the benzene ring. The benzylic carbon then is a special position. We've already seen that if we oxidize the ring, we're going to make the benzylic acid, which puts the carboxylic acid at the benzylic carbon. No. Yes, so, no, so if you've got a one carbon chain, you'll turn a CH3 into a COOH. If you've got a hundred carbon chain, you're still going to end up with benzoic acid. So it doesn't matter the size of the chain, you're always going to convert that carbon into a carboxylic acid. And because that's the benzylic carbon, that's why we call it benzoic acid. Or if we put an aldehyde there, that's benzaldehyde. That's where the benz term comes from, from the benzene ring, but also from benzylic. So that's the benzylic position. And it's going to be a special position because if I want to put a radical there, that's going to be the most stable position for the radical. And you might say, why? Well, because there's a whole bunch of resonance structures you can draw for that radical that you cannot write if you put them, if you put the ra if you put that dot in any of the other positions. That also means that in general that a carbocation will go into that benzylic position and be stable because it's a benzylic position and you can write all the possible resonance structures of that. And so that stabilizes, in theory, that stabilizes that position. So the benzylic position then is going to be your preferential position for radicals and for carbocations. Now, let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at the sheet that everybody, I put a sheet I think for everybody. The um, it says July 29th at the top. So I would like to take this benzene ring, and I would like to react. I would like to react that with NBS. So, what's my product going to look like? Okay, I'm going to free radically halogenate, and I'm going to put a bromine at the benzylic carbon. Why? Because of everything I said on the last slide. Right on the bottom of the last slide. But I do have a question. Because last week we ran into the conundrum of NBS versus Br2 and light. Could I use Br2 and light for this reaction? to do free radical halogenation. Can I do that? Yes or no? No? Why not? What happened last week? 
could add a two BRs to the double bond. Will that happen here? So last week we couldn't do this because the BR added two BRs to the double bond. Will the BR2 add to the benzene ring? No. Why not? Because it's so stable, because it's super stable. And because on the last two slides back, what did I say? Three, four slides back. BR2, no reaction. So the BR2 will not add to the double bond. So I could use either NBS or bromine and light. That would be perfectly fine to do. Bromine and light is perfectly fine to do free radical bromination on a side chain because it won't go into the benzene ring. Okay? So I've now brominated at the benzylic position. I now want to react this with NH2 minus. What am I going to form? And for all these reactions, I could basically write my structure, but then I got to put in the functional group that I'm making at a particular position. So what am I? What do I need? What's my product going to look like? Give me a functional group. What functional group am I making? Feel free. I'm making a double bond. So where should the double bond go? Um, okay, so I'll, this is carbon A, carbon B, carbon C, carbon D. Where should the double bond go between what two carbons? B and C? We don't like A and B? There's no room. What does that mean? There's no hydrogen at A. So again, what kind of mechanism is this? E, E, E2. So if I'm going all the way back to basics whenever I'm doing E2, alpha carbon, beta carbon, beta carbon, in this case, there's no hydrogen on this beta carbon. So that leaves me to form that double bond. Could I use tertiary butoxide? Could I use tertiary butoxide for this reaction? Is tertiary butoxide okay? Yes. Because there's only one beta hydrogen. So it doesn't matter what base I use, that's what I'm going to get. Okay, so what's special about this double bond that I just made? What kind of double bond is, is B and C? I would say that the double bond at B and C is in blank with the ring. In what? Um, actually, 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 no, it's not in the play. Starts with a C. That double bond is in conjugation with the ring. Of course, it's got to be perfectly planar to do that, and I don't think it is, but it is in conjugation. That's why the double bond will preferentially form there. So 
we've got a conjugated system. Now we could do two things with this molecule. Let's react it with R. Let's react it with R C double bond O O H peroxy acid. What am I going to make? A peroxide. A what? Epoxide. I'm going to make an epoxide. Okay. I'll make an epoxide and I'll label this A and B because you know what I'm going to do next. Well, you know what I'm going to do next because you have the sheet. Right? First thing I could do is react this with Cl minus and then H plus, or I could react this with HCl. So I can open up the epoxide under, under acidic conditions, or I could open it up using a strong nucleophile. So in each one of these cases, where are the groups going to go? Okay, so we're so I'm opening up this epoxide under acidic conditions or I'm opening it up under strong nucleophile conditions. So my A and my B carbons, A and B, and A and B are going to either have a Cl or an OH attached to it. Now? Okay. Okay. Okay, so the CL is going to go to B because it's less hindered. And then the OH would end up on carbon A as it's as it swings over. So so for the CL minus it's going to come in and attack carbon B. The epoxide is going to open up and end up with an O minus, and then we add the H plus to it to make OH. So this is going to be the major product under strong nucleophile ring opening. And it's attack and it's and the Cl minus is attacking B because B is the less hindered. You might say they're both secondary. True. But one has a ring on it and the other one has a methyl group. Which one's less hindered? The methyl group. What about the other one? What about adding HCl? So if I add HCl to this, I'm going to protonate the epoxide oxygen. All right, so if I'm over here, if I'm writing that out, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to make the, I'm going to protonate the epoxide. What's the epoxide going to do? Or what's the oxygen now that's protonated? It's going to push all of its electron density down to those two carbons. So where is the chloride going to add to? the carbon that is most which one's more positive or substituted but in this case they're the same substitution so we should probably take the more positive is going to give us the product so which one of those two carbons, A or B, is going to have the greater delta positive charge? Yeah, but I'm going to get a major product. It's going to add to one more than the other. 
So which one is it going to add to more than the other? A, because A is what? Well, those two are equally substituted. Because it has the ring. What kind of carbon is A? That's going to be a benzylic carbon. So what does that mean? That means that positive charge is going to be stabilized by all the double bonds in the ring. Just like if I did this, which I didn't, we didn't do this before, but we could have done this with like an allylic system. And maybe had the allylic carbon as part of the epoxide. That carbon would have a greater positive charge. Although that's an interesting... That's an interesting idea. You don't have to worry about that. That's just me thinking out loud. So chloride's going to add to carbon A. OH is going to then end up on B so that I'll get exactly the opposite product, which you probably suspected when I gave you the two different sets of conditions, although not always. If that was a cyclohexane ring, you would have ended up with both products. Well, under acidic conditions, you would end up with both products. Strong nucleophile methyl versus ring, it still would add to the methyl side. Okay. So again, another example where the benzylic position is important and plays a role. Does that make sense? I'm going through different side chain, we're going through different side chain reactions here, um, illustrating what we have to consider. And so also if I had this molecule, or no, actually this one. So I'm going to treat this one with NBS. What am I going to get? What kind of reaction is it? All right, so where is of A, B, and C here? Where's the bromine going to go? Because this is NBS, I'm adding a BR atom. So where is it going to go? What's, what's carbon C? Allylic. So carbon C is an allylic carbon, so that's where the bromine is going to go. It's in a double bond. Right? So if I use NBS, I don't add the bromine to the double bond. I add it to the benzyl or carbon, which in this case is C. So I'm going to add water to this. On this table, it says to add, or on this chart, it says to add water and then tell me what the kinetic and thermodynamic products are. So what does that mean? 
Well, I've got an allylic bromide here plus water. What's the first step in the mechanism? BR leaves to form an allylic carbocation. So when the bromine leaves, I'm going to end up with a plus charge there. What should I do with that allylic carbocation? Let's write its resonance structure. Uh, it kind of might seem like I'm piling on here since you just did this within the last hour and a half. Hopefully. So then I'm going to add water to each one of the carbocations, right? And it would be a two-step reaction, but I'm just going to simplify it by saying I'm going to end up with an OH here, and I'm going to end up with an OH here. You get products A and B. Which is which? A is the thermodynamic product, B is the kinetics product, kinetic product. Everybody agree? Everybody know where it comes from? B is the kinetic product because it comes from the most stable intermediate. This is the most stable intermediate. Or most stable carbocation. Why? It's more than secondary. Benzylic. It's a well. It's actually allylic as well, but it's it's the benzylic carbocation. So that's why it's the most stable. Now, product A is the thermodynamic product because it is the most stable. product, right? It's the most stable product. Why is it the most stable product? What? Why is A the most stable? It's got the more substituted double bond and that double bond is also in conjugation with the ring. So it's not only is it more substituted, which is true, but it's also now in conjugation with the ring. So in this example, yes, you could argue primary, secondary, but the benzylic position is important. It is an important position for you to be able to add to. Yes.
Well, here is the here is that issue. Here is exactly that issue. So, what is more state so what is more stable? The secondary the secondary benzylic position or the tertiary? And that's a good question. One of these, the next research talk I give, I'm going to start with that. And I'm going to hope that everybody in the audience has, that it's going to be two camps on this and they're going to argue and fist fight and everything else. Because that would be the perfect way to start a talk. Because here's the way this works. If we do this reaction with DCL, which is just the deuterium isotope of hydrogen, and I do this reaction, I end up with that product almost, almost exclusively, depending on the conditions. Not only that, but I end up with a little bit of that as well. I think there's still a D there. I end up with a little bit of D on the methyl group. I asked that same question. I convinced a research student to why well, I didn't convince them. They wanted to do research and I said, well, this is what we're going to do. And then we spent all last year trying to, first of all, get the double bond to react which wasn't as easy as you think. And we used deuterium because, if you know anything about NMR, the deuterium actually, the carbon, gets split by the deuterium, so whichever carbon is split into multiple peaks, that's where the deuterium is. So that's how I can tell where the deuterium went, as well as where the chloride went. It appears as though this tertiary carbocation is more stable than the secondary benzylic. Don't know why yet, that's, that's an issue. And once I form this carbocation, I actually can lose an H, form a double bond, and then add Markovnikov DCL to it. So that's where this little teeny tiny deuterium comes from. This is, this is actually the Markovnikov product. And, there, and some Japanese workers or some Japanese research group came up with a new way to do this reaction and all they said was you get the Markovnikov product as we did and they didn't they didn't go into any more detail so that's a good question what's more stable secondary benzylic or tertiary or a tertiary carbocation it appears as though it's a tertiary carbocation and I don't know why and this is where and this is the one that where I keep saying, well, in theory, you should get this because I know this reaction doesn't react according to my theory. So that's why I'm saying my theory. And also, this is the one that almost drive, drove Brian over the edge because he, he's like, you, this is not the way you taught us in lecture. And I said, yeah, I know. He goes, well, I don't know if I believe anything you teach us in lecture. And I said, well, with the exception of this, I think I'm pretty good on the other stuff. But this is a but this is a problem. We don't know why that secondary benzylic isn't as stable as the tertiary. And you asked about it being planar. The ring can't match up with the double the ring cannot be planar because the two hydrogens end up butting up against each other. So as a ring twists, does that keep it from becoming completely conjugated? And that's that's what I that's what we're operating under. So there's a lot of basic stuff out here that no one really knows about. Okay, for tomorrow, what I would ask you to do is to read in the book. There are videos, links to the video topics. Please read that for tomorrow. It's kind of tough, but 
We'll go over free or we'll go over electrophilic aromatic substitution tomorrow. You okay? It's hard. Okay. Um, I will post. So what we did was we just did that, um, and so what I'll do is I'll post the. I'll post the video here.